Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Um, I'm looking at our attendees panel. Looks like people are filing in. I wish I could see you in person. I wish I could see your smiling faces. This is always the, uh, this is sort of the famous after lunch panel when everyone's bloated and exhausted and, and falling asleep. So we'll try to keep it super interesting. We've got all our uh, professional youth athletes and, and uh, you know, the real social media experts here. So these guys will help keep it lively. Um, so welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us for the first time to the ninth Biennial Winter Wildlands Alliance Grassroots Advocacy Conference. Uh, biennials every two years. I remember fondly Vasu two years ago, uh, riding bird scooters through the streets of Boise. Um, you're going to miss that this year. The in-person thing is always so much fun because you get to bond with folks in between the panels and talk about stuff at, at, at greater length than we'll have time for here. Um, the, the, the positive side is that we've got people joining from all across the country. Uh, so we've got a really broad audience and um, people, uh, you know, don't have to travel and don't have to burn gas to get here. So um, we'll try to keep you all awake and keep it interesting and it'll go fast. Um, and just a little plug, two years from now, if we've sorted out all our public health uh, issues in this country, which we may or may not, but hopefully we do. We're, uh, we've got our eyes on the Pacific Northwest, so we'll try to find a fun venue where we can all actually get together in person and talk about this stuff. Um, so I'm David Page. I'm the Advocacy Director for Winter Wildlands Alliance. I'm based in Mammoth Lakes. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Um, Mammoth Lakes is in Paiahunadu as a region, uh, traditional and current homelands of the Paiute and Shoshone people. Uh, our main offices for Winter Wildlands Alliance, our core, core crew works in Boise, Idaho, which is Shoshone and Bannock territory. Um, my policy colleague, policy director, Hillary Eisen, works in Bozeman, Montana. And um, I, I'd have to let Connor do a land acknowledgement for Bozeman. It's super complex. There are so many different people that have been traveling through that place for so long. Uh, or, or Vasu could do it too, but I'm not going to even try. Um, we uh, are a national nonprofit. We are an alliance of 32 different grassroots groups across the country. Uh, we work to educate, inspire, and empower people to take care of their public lands, our public lands, and wild winter landscapes. Uh, we run a snow school program that uh, operates in 70 locations across the country and works to get about 34, 35,000 kids, mostly underserved kids, out on snow every winter. We also have a backcountry film festival, uh, which hopefully most of you have attended in, in its earlier iteration. It's, it's always a great way to get the community together. Usually on, in normal circumstances, travels to about a hundred different towns and cities uh, across the country and the world. Um, last year, it was mostly virtual. It's an important fundraiser for grassroots groups and snow school sites. So, so check out the schedule this year when it comes out. It's always really great programming. This year will be probably a mix uh, of either virtual screenings or hopefully some places will brave the elements and do screenings outdoors with uh, bonfires or whatever. Um, hate to mention fires with two massive ones burning just north of me. Um, but it will snow again, uh, we hope, at least one more time. A um, little bit of housekeeping. The theme of the conference here is can we save the backcountry from ourselves? We've had some really terrific discussions over the last couple of days. All of them have been recorded. This one is being recorded. Uh, they'll be up on our website for you to be able to share with your colleagues and friends. Please do. Um, we've talked about forest service funding. We've talked about trail hosts and snow rangers. We've talked about winter travel planning. We've talked about, um, you know, how to inspire individual responsibility and, and, and recreate responsibly etiquette. Um, we've talked about ski area expansions, just had a really robust discussion about ski area expansions. So much to talk about. Um, and today we're gonna talk about social media and the role of influencers in, in, in helping to establish uh, that, that responsible ethic for recreation uses. Um, but before we get into it, we've been talking about public lands for two days. Uh, we can't talk about public lands without acknowledging the long and 
really mostly tragic uh, and violent history of the lands that we now call public lands. Um, people have been living in and traveling through and depending on these landscapes for thousands of years. Um, and over the last couple hundred, uh, many of those people uh, have been forced out at gunpoint or in, in, in other violent circumstances or, or forced marches. Um, you know, we all, we know the history, but we, it's incumbent on all of us, I think, to remember that at all times, not just because we, you know, we're, we're probably not capable of returning to any former situation, but uh, I think it, 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 it really makes it uh, incumbent on all of us as contemporaries, uh, as citizens of a democracy to participate in how we manage these lands uh, and making sure that uh, that there's equitable access for all people to these lands and that we steward them uh, for the long term and really pay attention to how we're doing it. And that gets more and more complex over time, you know, whether that's, um, you know, advocating or participating in stewardship at the local level or talking to your Congress folks or interacting with land management agencies, um, a real gamut of ways for us to engage. And we'll talk about some of that here today. Um, uh, oh, and on that note, if you could, if you haven't already, please introduce yourself in the chat, um, who you are, what your pronouns are, where you're coming from. And uh, if you wouldn't mind also just giving a shout out to your local stewardship or advocacy organization, that'd be great too. Um, you know, that's sort of the best we can do for the social aspect of this since we can't see you. Um, you know, we can at least, you guys can interact a little bit in the, in the chat. And that'll get saved. And, and I can't look at it while I'm talking, but I'll be able to look at it afterwards. Um, and the, the way the run of show is going to go here, we'll have about 30, 35 minutes of, of, uh, of kind of structured discussion. This will be a little more free form because we've got a good dynamic crew here. Um, but we want to try to wrap up our, our main panel discussion by about quarter two so that we can open it up for some question and answer session, um, get some questions from attendees. And uh, if you have uh, questions as you're listening to folks, please drop those either in the chat or in the Q&A section. Uh, Melinda Quick, our... Um, our events director is in the background there behind the Winter Wildlands Alliance logo, and she will be uh, collating and capturing your comments and questions. And we'll, uh, I'll bring her on at quarter till to moderate and um, feed some of those questions to our panelists. So without further ado, um, I wanna go ahead and just, just throw it over to you guys as panelists. Thank you so much for joining us. You've all got really interesting experience and expertise and perspectives. Um, and so if we can just do a quick lightning round of, of introductions from each of you, um, who you are, what you're working on, and then we'll jump into discussion. I'll start with you, Vasu. Cool, thanks, Dave. Um, my name is Vasu Sojitra, pronouns are he, him. And I'm on the lands, I'm a visitor on the lands of the Crow, Northern Cheyenne, Salish Kootenai, Shoshone, Bannock, Blackfeet, and many others that call, that is commonly known as Bozeman, Montana. I think there's more than 20 plus different tribes, nations, and confederacies that have moved and have moved uh, through these lands. So um, it's a very um, well-known space for Native folks. Um, I am a professional athlete and a disability access strategist, uh, also a disabled person of color, Indian American, uh, with the motto of ninja sticking through the woods to bring intersectionality to the outdoors. Um, and yeah, that's, you know, um, I'm also a co-founder of Inclusive Outdoors Project and an ambassador for Winter Wildlands Alliance. So thanks, thanks for having me here. Thanks for being here, Vasu. Mm -hmm. um, over to you, Elsa. Hi everyone, um, I'm Elsa Walsh, I'm the Development and Communications Manager at Leave No Trace. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm here today in Boulder, Colorado, which is within the territories of the Ute, Cheyenne and Arapaho peoples. In addition, there are 48 contemporary tribal nations that are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. Um, and like I said, I work at Leave No Trace. It's a national nonprofit that uses the power of 
science, education, training, and people to ensure a sustainable future for the outdoors. Uh, we're based kind of on the seven leave no trace principles, and it's an education framework for making good decisions in nature. I'm glad to be here with you all today. Great to have you. Thanks so much. Connor. Connor Ryan, Amitiape, Ma Lakota, Ikche Wichasha, Mielo, Etan Heska. Um, greetings, relatives. Uh, you know, I greet you all today with a good hand and a good heart. Uh, my name is Connor Ryan. I'm Lakota, uh, common man. My, my pronouns are he, him. And I'm coming to you from uh, Heska, or as my people call it, uh, the Rocky Mountains. Um, I'm here on the lands of the the Ute, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, and the Achete Shakoin Nation, my nation. Um, yeah, and I'm really stoked to be able to talk to you all today. I'm an ambassador for Natives Outdoors. We're an indigenous owned and operated media and apparel company, um, as well as an ambassador for Patagonia. Great. Thanks, Connor. Great to have you. Danny, go ahead. Hello, everyone. I'm Danny Carolina Reyes Acosta. My pronouns are she, her, or Ea. Um, I am based right now on the stolen lands of the Ute and Pueblo people. Uh, which is out in Southwest Colorado. I do a variety of different things. I'm a professional snow athlete. I'm also a trail runner, um, a rock climber, and a strategist, a brand strategist, marketing strategist, storyteller, and now filmmaker. So I do a fair amount of things, but uh, most of all, I love being in community and having these types of conversations. So thank you everyone for having me and sharing this space and excited to get it kicked off here. Thanks for being with us, Danny. Just as a note, your there your microphone's a little bit muted. It's hard. It's hard. Really hard to hear you. So I don't know anything you can do. To, anything you can do to get up close or turn it up or or whatever, because we want to hear what you have to say. Um, great. So to kick it off, uh, Elsa, I'm going to give it to you. Uh, I know you guys at Leave No Trace uh, have done a fair amount of research recently about sort of recreation trends, and we've been talking for the past two days about. Um, you know, increasing recreation of public landscapes and, and, you know, sort of the pros and cons of that. Obviously, the good side is that, uh, you know, more people means more advocates for the places that we love. Uh, and the downside, of course, is, you know, the, the impacts and trash and crowding and, and all the different community impacts that, that some of us have seen over the last couple of years. So that's, you know, it's a delicate balance. But if you could just, just kind of set us up with some some trends that you've seen that'd be super helpful yeah yeah so um kind of it's hard to go back and think about it now but between march and may of 2020 uh leave no trace did some research with penn state university to kind of look into in real time how covid was changing the way that people were spending time outside and then we followed up um, this spring and kind of did a similar study to really check in and see one year later, how have those habits kind of changed in one year into the pandemic? And what we found was that people were recreating more, they were using public lands more, and that the majority of people really felt as though those habits had changed permanently due to COVID. And so essentially a lot of a lot more people are getting outdoors, which I think all of us kind of anecdotally knew anyway. Um, and then when we think about that in terms of social media use, for a long time now with Leave No Trace, there was a call to kind of provide some guidance about how to use social media responsibly and specifically in terms of sharing locations attracting even more people to kind of specific areas and I think there was kind of the feeling that there did need to be more messaging on social media around protecting these places and really inviting people into the conversation about how to recreate responsibly but you know over the past few years we at Leave No Trace felt as though well the answer isn't as simple as just don't share your location which was definitely kind of what the what some of the feedback we were hearing. Um, but really we found in our work that many people just don't, haven't grown up learning how to care for the outdoors or where to go um, or how to recreate there safely. And so 
we kind of created some guidance around social media because we do think that it's it can be a really powerful tool to be informative and kind of equip everybody with that knowledge. That's great. Thanks for teeing us up there. Um, so I'm just going to throw out kind of a general question and we'll start with Connor and then we'll go to Vasu and then we'll go to Danny to, Danny to talk about um, really what is the role of the, of the social media influencer? You know, how can we promote, how, how does mentorship, what, is, what does that look like in a, in a social and an online space? And how does that feed out into, you know, on the ground stewardship? Um, I'll go ahead and start with you, Connor. Yeah, um, I, I think for me, you know, this guidelines for stewardship for me as, as a Lakota come from my cultural understanding of, of what it means to be in relationship with the land. And that's uh, really central to who we are as people is understanding that we are related to all of it, that we are not apart from any of it. Um, and, and that is something that feels obvious maybe in our experiences as athletes that bond us to the land, that, that perfect powder day and the way you feel connected to a landscape after that. But it's also the reminder that that is at the same time ecological and that there's no way for us to remove ourselves from being that deeply connected to these places, right? Like we ourselves are also nature and every interaction that we have out there is in some form of reciprocity or not with these places that uh, give us these experiences. And so for me, it really becomes about putting the focus onto that, onto how am I making relations with the place as opposed to having this goal-based or kind of extractive relationship with the outdoors or with the mountains, where it's like, I must reach this summit in order to prove X, Y, Z in a film, in social media, in whatever it might be. And instead realizing that the, the real empowerment of bringing more people into, na into nature um, is for us to deepen those bonds and feel those um, as opposed to going out there and getting something that, that can be shared. So for me, I try to focus as much as possible on talking about the, the depth and beauty that those bonds bring to my life and, and how that allows me to indigenize my experience as a skier. That's awesome. Um, and what are the outlets just for, for, for our attendees? What, what are your channels? How are you talking to people? Yeah, for me, you know, mostly uh, a lot of Instagram, social media, stuff like that. And then um, I've put out some films recently. Uh, this year I put out a film with, with Icon Pass uh, called My Connection, where myself and uh, professional snowboarder and climber Lonnie Kauk, who's also indigenous, um, got to talk about what it is that we get from going out to the mountains every day and how that relates to our culture. Um, and, and I'll be putting out a film with REI this winter as well that, that really deepens that and expands, you know, how not only that relationship can be reciprocal for ourselves in nature, but that if you're having a reciprocal relationship with nature, you're then also obligated to the traditional nations and indigenous peoples who inhabited that space before you recreated in the backcountry there. That's great. Thanks, Connor. I'm going to throw it over to you, Vasu. Same, same question. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I back Connor on all this stuff, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to be native to be reciprocal to the land that we're on. And, you know, um, as a visitor of these lands, I do my best as, you know, non-native to be able to provide that reciprocity as much as possible, whether that be um, stewarding the land in a way that comes with local advocacy or sharing a lot of um, local natives that are doing um, amazing work in the area or nationally, even, you know, things that Connor posts or other uh, relationships I have in the native community that I try to share um, either, you know, with my community here in Bozeman or online as well. You know, it's, it's pretty broad what the word community means for me. And, um, you know, whether that's the disabled community or the communities of color that I'm connected with, getting them outside to be able to, you know, connect with the lands that we're on. Uh, Bozeman has a massive uh, Mexican and South American population. So trying to, you know, connect with some of those folks um, and get them to, you know, just be outside and see how powerful nature can be in our transformation as humans. So um, that's kind of the, the biggest thing that I've been trying to do is just use my voice to elevate other people in the, in the process. 
Great. And I'll, I'll ask you the same question. What are your main channels for, for engagement? Um, I do a fair bit of community organizing here in Bozeman, whether that be through Inclusive Outdoors Project or just my, me personally being well known in the Bozeman area, um, but also online as well through a lot of like discussions like this, um, other panels, other um, ways of, um, you know, putting this message out there, whether that be social media. Um, I'm also one of the uh, founding members of Outdoor Future Initiative which is more of a policy-driven um, resource allocating um, initiative, more focused on racial and ethnically diverse communities to get you know, more money towards uh, organizations that are doing that work on the ground. So um, a lot of different paths when it comes to trying to um, elevate more folks of color, disabled folks, you name it, queer folks, any, any marginalized community out there. Awesome, thanks Vasu, great mm -hmm. work. Danny, I'm gonna throw it over to you. Um, talk to us about the role of influencers and mentorship and responsible use. Sure, first of all, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. We're yeah, good? it's a lot better, okay. yeah. Thank I'm, you. I'm a low talker, so I'm just gonna project and pretend we're actually in person and there's a microphone. Nice. Um, I think, <laughs> you know, it's, it's so, I think to just be in, be in a room with other people that are thinking about how do we move away from a perspective where ego is driving why we are in a place, right? Objective driven adventure is, is in some ways a more modern manifestation of the extractive type of approach that has put the West in the, in the big pickle that it is right now, right? With wildfires, with water, with drought. And it's when we go to a place thinking, I need to get this thing out of this place, that's what can, you know, leads to people getting benighted on climbs, stuck in avalanches, summit fever, and all sorts of bad things because it's our ego driving us. So I think if we're just kind of to put another pivot on what both Connor and Vasu spoke to, I think there's this idea of moving away from egocentric approach and moving towards ecocentric uh, uh, mindfulness, right? If you were, if you will. Um, and so I think every every person has to remember that. Like an influencer isn't someone that necessarily has 10 million followers, right? Like I am not Khloe Kardashian, nor do we'll just leave that for another time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm just a person and I have a community of friends and new friends on the internet, as well as in person in digital conversations like this. And I think it's really important that every single person here remember that we all have our spheres of influence, right? And in so many ways, oftentimes, even when we have really small followings, that those can be the most impactful voices. Because when we choose to speak up, if you have 100, 200, 300 followers, right, those are the people that are really listening to you every single day. So I think it's important that all of us remember that we have the power to raise our voice and say what we think or believe in, um, especially if, well, as it concerns this advocating for stewardship and an inclusive community. Um, and so I think when we're looking at how does how can everyone be a better mentor, whether they are a professional athlete or an educator or a conservationist or Joe Schmo that just is looking to get outside for the first time or put on skis for the first time, you know, asking questions and, and bringing transparency to information and education, because I think that what has prevented the proliferation of mentorship has to do with the mentality of gatekeeping. It has to do with the mentality of this is mine, it's not for you. And that sort of um, continuation of the negative energy that says like, I like, the, it's just a bad attitude, right? Like I earned getting here, so I'm not going to share it with you. And that is a whole other can of worms that I'm not going to open just yet. But I do think that with mentorship and, and stewardship in general, we share information and we ask questions with an open heart. Um, we can all have a lot more fun. Yeah. And, and, and nowhere is that gatekeeping more palatable than amongst backcountry skiers and riders, I would say. Traditionally, oh, yeah. we are a group of people who like to protect our stashes and, and, you know, think of the amount of powder as a, as a, a zero sum game that uh, mm. you know, we have to consume and extract before the next person does. Right. 
Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. There, so, there is a lot of snow to go around yeah. and there are a lot of beautiful places we can share. But we have to change the culture a little bit to get to that. So on that note, um, I'm going to kick it back to you, Elsa. Uh, you know, you leave no trace has just done such a fabulous job at, at, you know, creating those principles. I know a lot of research goes into that. I certainly grew up by them. Um, you know, they're definitely something to hang on to. Uh, and I think they serve and they work really well. Obviously for a lot of people, it, it's, it's hard to remember seven principles. Um, you know, how do you, how do you hang on to that when you, you get out there, you're in the back country, wait, what were those seven principles? So, you know, I wonder if sort of underlying all of that, if there's a strategy to reaching people and, you know, really changing kind of the core ethic. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Like not everybody has grown up with that. And we we do research and kind of come out with new guidance all the time. But, you know, like I said, we we came up with our social media guidance a couple of years ago, but really like if I had to distill that down or boil it down to something I think it just is kind of doing your best um, so you know we're the center for outdoor ethics when you think about what that really means sure we all need to know how to be safe in the outdoors and what we're doing to an extent but as Danny said not everyone is an influencer um, not everyone's doing an intense outdoor sport. I'm certainly not. Um, and a lot of people kind of in the leave no trace community are just getting outside and going for a walk after work. Um, and so, you know, our guidance to those people is trying to kind of incorporate some leave no trace or just stewardship or ethics into what you're doing and then also kind of again what we were saying about your sphere of influence maybe it's just telling your friends about your hike and when they're asking you about it saying oh yeah I had to keep my dog on a leash or whatever it was that you, the step that you took and I think that that actually has kind of a more meaningful um, online and offline kind of impact in terms of what we've really seen in changing behavior is just you you trust the people around you right you listen to the people around you and that's that's who you want to hear that from and so you know we definitely of course we encourage people to learn to learn the seven principles but hey if you can't say them right off the bat then that's okay I think um that kind of attitude and f having that sense of ethics and stewardship is you know, whether or not you have tens of thousands of people or if you're Khloe Kardashian or not, that's who you're, um, that's how you're kind of going to make that impact and, um, you know, really, really enact some change, right? Nice. Two, two Kardashian references already. In, in yeah, I liked the first yeah. ones. <laughs> um, great. So uh, I'll, I'll shift uh, and put kind of put the outdoor industry in the hot seat for a minute, but both of you, all of you have worked in one way or another with brands. Um, you know, brands are obviously important as a source of funding. You know, we all love our gear. Uh, what is the responsibility of the outdoor industry in this sphere um, to, to, to help, you know, not just sell gear, but, but make sure that we're protecting the landscapes and taking care of each other. Um, I'll go ahead and start with you, Connor. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me personally, you know, the way that I'm drawn to see it right off the bat as an indigenous person is this is a, a trillion dollar industry, basically, that that takes place because of stolen land. And that land was stolen from the people who, who were the stewards. Um, so if, if brands are going to extract a profit from these places, which is more or less what's happening, there's no other place for resources to come from on this planet other than the planet itself. That's how it works. Um, and if the money is being made by people having experiences on the land, um, that, then I think it puts the full obligation on, on the outdoor industry. Um, and at the same time that that's a big obligation, it's also a big opportunity uh, because we also have the, the ability, like in my state in Colorado, where our tourism and our outdoor industry is much larger than any extractive industry, much bigger than coal or mining or any of these other things. Um, and so I think it puts the opportunity for these brands that are making 
all this money to then reinvest, to lobby, to do all these things, to fight for a different sort of future uh, beyond extraction. And I think that's, that's a beautiful thing. And there's a lot of brands out there, you know, that, that do a great job of working to change that narrative. That's becoming more and more popular. You know, Solomon just put out a big uh, environmental uh, commitment for themselves this year. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I'm a representative of, of Patagonia and that's, you know, I think we're the, the industry standard in a lot of ways for how to do uh, these ethics within the outdoor industry and be the least extractive possible. Uh, but at the same time, our stance is kind of always, and even we have a long way to go and even we can do a lot better and even we are just getting started. And so I think that that's the truth of, of where we're at. And, you know, I just really commend the brands that do go to indigenous people and, and put us at the center of the storytelling and allow us to uh, lead the way on how these narratives need to be restored because uh, uh, you know, so often we want the industry to uh, decolonize. But for me, I think that word is really funny because there's no uh, framework of what that really is. And so for me, I think it's, it's to indigenize instead to learn how to make our, our loops closed when it comes to the things that we're using uh, to, to do these sports and, and the materials that it takes to make it happen. And at the same time, changing the culture and the narrative to, to see ourselves as recreationalists and as a part of nature itself. So yeah, it a, it's a long road, but we're, we're really, I think, just beginning in earnest now. Yeah, that's well said, Connor. Vasu, I'll throw it to you. You've got a long history working with brands. What have been the challenges? Have there been successes? Uh, you know, how are we doing? Um, I always think anyone can do better. And I think the industry is, again, as Connor said, pretty much taking the baby steps to start this process. Um, you know, I think culture is also built on policy and the art industry is, again, as Katie actually put in the chat, is it's on them to create that cultural change and based on marketing, based on different initiatives, based on who's at the table, creating different tables for people of color, disabled folks, queer folks, anyone that does identify as marginalized so that we have a voice that can, in the end, the idea is to protect and steward everything around us, including humanity. Uh, so, you know, the idea is to diversify everything. Um, so the outdoor industry is just getting there. I think there's a slight revolution happening based on the several past years, but, you know, I think we just have to keep that momentum going as much as possible. Of course, some brands are going to just completely avoid it, but others are going to jump headfirst into the deep end. And um, I think we just have to support those brands as much as possible, not in a consumer end, but just sharing a lot of the projects that they might be sharing or, you know, taking part in different initiatives that they're taking part in when it comes to stewarding or protecting or um, you name it. So that's that's kind of where I'm at. And I've, I've been seeing that a lot. And I think brands just have to provide a little bit more transparency as to what they are actually doing. Um, some brands have been doing that and others have not, but I think people really want to see what brands are doing behind the scenes from the supply chain all the way to, you know, the ground floor where people are buying their stuff um, to their leadership to know what percentage of, uh, you know, leaders are within the gender spectrum or how many folks at the table are disabled or whatever it may be. So um, I think there just needs to be more and more transparency on that end too. I appreciate that, Vasu, and and kudos to you guys for doing the hard work. I mean, as you know, we what we see of your work is is the outward facing. You know, you're reaching us, um, the broader public. But I I know internally there's a ton of work, and it's hard to to push back on these uh, you know industry partners and keep them keep their feet to the fire and keeping them honest and transparent and pushing them to do more is 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 hard work. So appreciate it, Danny. Yeah, you know, I think that it's it's so I, I love hearing him talk about policy, the brand standpoint, and Vasu, thank you for set unwittingly setting me up for this perfect segue, right? And in some way, the way that individuals, whether they're established athletes um, or influencers or people that are coming up into this space, right? I think it's really important that I mean, I'm a Latina AAPI athlete that also has mixed European heritage. So like, I know that as a storyteller and as an athlete, and I encourage anyone else out there that is like trying to figure out how to own their story to realize that 
right now we are a commodity, right? And so there are a lot of efforts in the space that different brands are trying are pushing to diversify and create their their content and uh, make their content pipelines more inclusive. And I think that for next generation leaders that identify as more diverse voices, that we realize that we can, when we take these opportunities, we have the power to be able to hold brands accountable and push back when something doesn't feel right, when something doesn't look right, and when something doesn't sit right with both ourselves as individuals, as well as the way it's going to impact our broader communities. Because as you said, David, what the public perceives is one thing. And what's happening sometimes behind closed doors or via email is very different, right? I mean, I can pers- like, and I think that it's really important that all of us, when we enter into these partnerships, are creating values-based partnerships that align with our own, like our own personal values, right? Like the reason I partner with Solomon and Deuter and Trail Butter and Protect Our Winners is not just because I think they make really cool stuff or advocate for really cool things. I think it's it's because I believe in the product, I believe in the supply chain, and I believe in what they're doing for people on planet. And like, I would just encourage everyone, like as they're thinking about what, how to not just what they're, the content they consume with brands, but when they're trying to figure out how do they become a part of that equation, what are they bringing to the table and what are they advocating for? Absolutely, that's great. Elsa, give you a chance to, to weigh in. I know you guys have worked with brands. How's that? How's that work? Um, You've known yeah. Grace <laughs> I mean, definitely a different, definitely a different perspective. But you know, I think that as kind of the development side of my job in terms of finding corporate partners and working with corporate partners, we just have learned a lot in the past few years of who um you know who is really kind of committed to what we're doing and that shows I think a lot in how much they include us in their messaging and um that ends up making a much more successful partnership and then I think that they enjoy working with us much more too um but you know yeah I think that I guess my my personal experience of working in fundraising is that you can tell pretty quickly when when brands really are kind of putting their money where their actions are, and um, that tends to make a much more meaningful partnership for us as an organization. Yeah, good. Um, okay, so we've got about probably five minutes before we want to open it up to Q and A, <clears throat> and that gives me time to open up a couple cans of worms. Um, which you guys can go ahead and just pass on if you'd like. But one, one thing I've been thinking about a lot <clears throat> of late, uh, you know, with all the COVID restrictions and different, you know, new quota and permit systems going into place. Um, you know, when we talk about equitable access, I, I think we haven't yet had the really hard conversation about equitable access to what, um, you know, equitable a- access to public lands, great. I think we all understand that. But what about equitable access to uh, uncrowded spaces? Um, you know, is that something that we can get involved in or push for, or, or is that too complex? I mean, obviously, you, you throw down a quota system. You know, Yosemite for the last two years here in my backyard has had a had a day permit thing, which is incredibly exclusive. And certain people, you know, if you don't have the time off. If you don't, if you don't know the ropes, you, you can't get into Yosemite right now. Um, but the flip side of it is that if you do get into Yosemite, you have access to an experience that otherwise might be just thronged with millions of people. Um, so, does anyone want to take that one on? Anybody? Connor, what do you think? Um, yeah, I would just say briefly, like. I think it's a really nuanced thing and I think it depends on the place and proximity to urban areas and how it's promoted. Um, And I think just how we promote and talk about places and what we advertise places as is a huge part of that, right? Like there's some places that we've turned into a Disneyland and there's maybe no like putting uh, that cat back in the bag. And I think that's just a a thing to be mindful of as we move forward um in how we talk about places and you know value different spaces and i would think the other thing is like i I think it's 
it's maybe a pattern that works in some forms, but it also can't be something that, that limits indigenous people's access to, to food systems, medicines, um, and, and traditional ceremonies. That, that's something that comes to mind with, for me with places like uh, Devil's Tower and, you know, other various spots that are have ceremonial significance. And there's other times when it should be closed for certain activities, things like that. I just think that, uh, you know, the, the cultural needs of indigenous peoples needs to be at the front of that because most national parks and places that are implementing these systems were systematically taken from indigenous people. Yeah. Yeah. And Connor and I had this discussion actually, cause I, I climbed Denali and skied off of it. And, um, it was like a, you know, first and whatnot. And I don't really enjoy first anyways, but, you know, acknowledging that, like, is there a way to create some sort of policy where a certain percentage of funding uh, per user goes directly to the nations that are of that land? And that could start creating programming within their communities to get their, you know, future generations out on the land to be able to provide that equitable access, not maybe to that specific national park, but ideally, yes, to maybe other areas that the land is what the land that they occupy at the moment. So, um, you know, is that a possibility? I think that could be, you know, I think policy has a very strong hold of how we again, develop culture and de develop a lot of this access to our so-called public lands. I mean, white folks have had access to public lands for a very long time based on a lot of stolen land and genocide. So, you know, just trying to make sure that we start allocating those resources in a way that is providing access to not just, you know, the top status quo, but to everyone that might, you know, have had that connection to that land or still has that connection to that land. So, um, yeah, that was a really cool discussion that we were having over the phone a few months ago. And wanted to bring that up. Nice. That's great. Danny, anything? Also, on that? sorry, can I add one more thing? Yeah, yeah. Another thing, I don't know if any of you saw, but um, I believe uh, Senator Holland, or sorry, not, yeah, Senator Holland just is about to appoint another Native person onto the National Board Service or National Park Service. So, um, which is really cool to get more Native folks into these policy changes that will hopefully provide some of those resources back and provide some sort of, you know, resource allocation back to Native folks. So that's, a, I think that's a big way to, again, provide that equitable access in the ways that people, you know, culturally um, would like to connect to the land. Nice, absolutely. Danny. Okay, I'll just add on one more layer. I love this that we're kind of like layering these different aspects, right, of indigeneity and indigenous leadership. Um, we have our adaptive and our diverse, and our other divorced voices. And I think there's, we'd be remiss even thinking about Outdoor Future and its work. If you haven't looked up Outdoor Future, please everyone go look them up because they're doing some amazing work in the policy space. Yeah. Is thinking about, you know, when I go back to my original point about um, extractive recreation or extractive tourism, what is the meaning of adventure in modern North American society or Western society? There's this idea, I think, of like, how do we interface with these communities that we visit? Right, so there have been some communities that have been completely erased. There are lots of communities that have been marginalized and there are also communities that have been left behind and fundamentally serve as almost like a, a Disneyland or you might know it as a gateway community or if you speak the lingo or maybe you just know it as the place where you rent your Airbnb and maybe buy some groceries, do your thing and then get out of town. I think it's really important when we're thinking about permits um, and I, I'm totally speaking to an idea I'd seen from uh, I forget which nonprofit a couple of weeks ago that was trying to figure out how to make uh, quotas and permits more accessible for those who don't have access to technology, who don't have access to libraries or urban areas. And this nonprofit was working on getting the local permitting and like it like embedded in the gateway community itself and trying to create more awareness of all the things that help people not just get registered and permitted but also make sure that they have what they need um, as far as education and preparedness and so on and so forth. And I thought it was really cool to think about like, how can we involve the communities that are launch pads for adventures? Um, and oftentimes uh, when, when, we're, when we're engaging in adventure tourism, 
sometimes people don't even like stop in these communities, right? Like you just pass on through and maybe you get some gas. Um, and in, in so many ways, like these are some of the communities that even though they look really nice and they have houses that sell for $12 million, um, there are still people that live there and work there. And um, those are the people that are affected every single day by our tourism, right? Um, and, and just trying to think about like, how can we make it full circle? Yeah, that's great. Okay, so we're at about a quarter to the hour here. I want to open it up for some q and I want to bring Melinda on. Um, and depending on how many questions she has and how the timing goes, maybe I'll pull out of my back pocket one more can of worms at the end. Yeah, I love those can of worms, David. Uh, we got to figure out a, a winter-centric uh, phrase for that because <laughs> thinking about worms constantly is not been my favorite. <laughs> but and, and of anchovies or smoked, sure. smoked oysters. <laughs> sure. Delicious. <laughs> Um, we do have one question right now. So folks, if you've got questions, please put them in the Q and a or in the chat. I'm looking at them right there, but we've got one from Howie. Um, Howie says, it seems that folks, especially, um, younger people are more willing to engage on social media, but are unwilling to write letters to elected officials or take action that will cause change is engaging in social media actually detrimental. That's a really great question. Wow. That's a great question. Can I try yeah. and take a yeah, do it. Uh, go for it. That? <laughs> because I think it's it's so it's so interesting because in some ways social media is a larger uh gosh symptom of 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 things that are happening in our times, right? Of consumer, like non-conscious consumer capitalism, right? Like it's much easier to open your phone and scroll and look at shiny pretty things than it is to write a letter. Um and so on one hand, I think there's a lot bigger conversation around mental health and mindfulness and the ways that we as creators or conservationists or anyone in between can support healthy creation and consumption of social media, but that's not the question. I mean, maybe, or maybe it is the question. Please clarify how if I'm missing the point. But um, in my mind, I think to, to get young people engaged and writing letters, you have to make it really easy. Right. I mean, I come from a marketing background. So, and I, my, my job used to be to market change, right? Um, and change oftentimes that people didn't want. And so, my, what I learned in that job, I mean, I used to work for Nike. And so, we, there were these big global changes that would be happening within the organization with our wholesale partners and employees. And the only way that we got people excited about change is by making it impactful, meaningful relevant to them and super easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, from an advocacy standpoint, all of this is double-edged sword, right? I mean, on some levels we have tools, digital tools that are easier than we've ever had, where it really is just push a button, send a letter to your congressperson, um, which is awesome. And you can mobilize people by social media that way. I think, especially for legislative processes, you can really have impact through social media. What's tricky is the administrative processes because like when you're talking about a forest plan or a winter travel plan or something, you know, a ski area expansion, um, it's a different, a different set of decision makers that you're trying to influence and they're not necessarily gonna be on social media looking for, looking for answers. Um, anybody else got something on that one? Yeah, um, I'd like to add to that one. <laughs> um, I think for me, like it's, it's even considering as an indigenous person that that is a, of writing a letter to a senator is even a way that we can affect change, right? And so that's the thing for me is like coming from a traditionally completely ignored group of people, like senators, Congress people, they don't represent me. And so my goal is I want to change the mind of the senator's son. I want to change the mind of all of the younger constituents. I want to find the person who shares my passion for the outdoors, right? but they have a law degree and they can run and change and, and make that change themselves, you know? And so I think that's, that's a big part of it. And, and it's a big part of Powell's culture of change and, and theory of change is that like the cultural side of it is maybe the most integral thing. And so for me, that's, that's what this work in the social media spheres is, is it's about creating cultural change where you need to make the ideas that are anti-environment so massively unpopular with the masses that it's unconsiderable because basically how things exist right now is like we have uh you know neoliberals and we have ultra conservatives and there's nobody really 
in representing the environment, right? So like we have Biden in office who was supposed to be, you know, the better of the choices that we have. And now he is poisoning the Mississippi River by allowing the Enbridge Line 3 pipeline. And so, and there's no amount of letters we're going to send to Joe Biden that's going to going to change that necessarily. And I think that's the kind of thing that we have to keep in mind is like our government as it exists is entirely beholden to like corporate interests. And so we have to create a cultural groundswell that, that changes that uh, at a core level in our society that, that makes these, these anti-environment views as stigmatized as any anti-human view. Um, and I think that's a really important level of change right now that, that sometimes gets overlooked um, by, by just being like, oh, it's just social media. It's like, well, social media is the, the culture of our world right now. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add to that a little bit where, no, I don't think social media is detrimental. There's like information at our fingertips constantly it is overwhelming that's 100 percent sure but it's we just have to pick and choose where we want to get our information from a little bit more uh i guess aware and i think you know i mean i don't like blaming the future generations because i know they're going to do better than the previous generations i'm you know like we we were getting yelled at as millennials by the boomers and look what the boomers have done for us so it's like you know it's it's there's a lot of different viewpoints when it comes to generations i think the next generation is going to kick some ass when it comes to policy change you're we're seeing it a lot with um the sunrise movement and how impactful they were in getting young people to vote in the first place for this giant transition we just had this year like past year so um that was huge and then also like within the, the disability community like we've been screaming this from the rooftops um if we had access to the rooftops but is that um, during COVID, because the most privileged finally were impacted by a temporary disability like COVID, uh, then people can work from home. Whereas uh, disabled people were asking to work from home for, I don't know, decades, and they were getting no from their bosses. And now everyone is working from home. And because of that, like, you know, same thing goes with social media, like disabled advocates use social media heavily when it comes to engaging community. Uh, we just started a new initiative called We Are 15, and that's a Paralympic-based um, initiative trying to incorporate disability model into a lot of the outdoor recreation that we see. So, um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a really cool way of getting social media to actually get people rallied up. And, of course, there's going to be a full spectrum of horrible things out there and whatnot, but, you know, we just have to kind of pick and choose and see who follows. So um, that's, that's kind of my take long-term, large-scale, generational change. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think if we go back to just put a cherry on it, it's really thinking about how the people in this room, all of us, can make sure, like Ross, you said, pick and choose. Like, who are we supporting on social media? How are we supporting the creation and development of content and people that are creating that content that does good for the world, Right. I think it's really easy to demonize social media, but it's also important, like Connor said, to, remind, to remember that social media is a part of our culture and we have to figure out how to play that game because it's, it ain't going away. <laughs> yeah, got to harness it. Elsa, you got anything on that? Yeah, I don't know. I agree with everyone. I guess maybe I, maybe I'm like optimistic, but I, I actually have a lot more hope for younger generations doing stuff on social media and through that as a tool we we just got on TikTok because we realized that <laughs> there were hundreds of thousands of leave no trace hashtags on TikTok already and like that uh, to me that does seem hopeful and obviously you know you don't want to use the hashtag without taking some action but um I think even kind of in our first month or so of TikTok use, I'm feeling a bit more optimistic again about our online presence <laughs> than I was. So um, yeah, I, I think I, I feel more excited about the action that our younger audience are willing to take really. 
That's great. Thanks for the optimism. Great question, Howie. Melinda, you got anything else? Yeah, I've got two more that I'm hoping we can get to um, both of them. So we'll just start with um, Haley from Alaska Trails mentions that a model they're working with within adventure tourism is a voluntary 10% payment of their gross receipts to conservation organizations that puts indigenous voices at the forefront. Um, she says, no doubt, uh, no one doubts that for-profit companies in the outdoor space may pay upwards of 10% towards insurance or rent. Uh, and is curious if we can think of more ways that would encourage more businesses to see this support as a necessary business expense. It might just be an idea. Everybody nods their heads, but <laughs> yeah, great idea. It's, it's a great idea. I felt it was worth awesome. saying out loud. I mean, it's kind of the idea of like giving back money for each user that comes into national parks almost. Um, I think yeah. just another way of like that land back mentality to native folks. Definitely. I think it's rad. It's the kind of thing I'd like to see as legislation. Like when you, consider it like <clears throat> treaty law and that that is the constitution of the United States and those treaties are totally ignored. Uh, it doesn't seem like a crazy thing that we would put a tax on the outdoor industry as a whole. And if we did that as a whole, it probably wouldn't need to be 10%, right? Even 5% or 2% or 1% or, you know, something super small uh, would, would add up for a big way in our communities. And I think we would see our community solutions be able to be implemented. And I think that would have huge climate impacts and access impacts that are beneficial for all users. Definitely. Of course, I can already hear the outdoor industry voice in my head because I've heard it over the last couple of weeks, which is, hey, if, if you tax us more, we're going to have to raise the prices of our gear, which is already not accessible to everyone. Um, tricky stuff. For sure. And uh, the last question. Oh, Danny, did you want to add to that? No, it was just a punctuation. I mean, I'm a big advocate for used gear because it's better for the environment and it's a really good way to keep things out of landfills and it's accessible. Yeah. Great, great punctuation. Thank you for that. Um, and not to open our maybe largest can of snow is what I'm going to say. We've opened all the cans, I feel like so far, so why not? Um, okay. But yeah, but um, Mike says that Mike used to reveal locations on social media, but nowadays invariably keep them anonymous. Um, not trying to be a gatekeeper, just genuinely concerned about sensitive locations being overwhelmed with visitors, especially considering desperately understaffed land management agencies. In the interest of a welcoming vibe, facilitating equitable access to our shared wild places, where do we draw the line? And I know that we've tossed gatekeeping around here and there, so it'd be helpful, I think, just to quickly mention what that is um, and then kind of see how we feel as a panel about how you approach those things. I know Vasu has, has a good amount of thoughts on, on it as well. So I will try to share some resources in the chat. There it is. Geotagging. Yes or no. Vasu. Go. Uh, so gatekeeping is one person or people knowing information and withholding it from other groups of people, primarily within the outdoor space. It's usually, you know, privileged folks versus, uh, under-resourced folks that might not know how to access certain spaces or knowledge or whatever it may be. So um, that's the that's kind of my version of gatekeeping. Um, I personally don't think geotagging is the issue. It's more that land management side, as you brought up, that understaffed land management side. And I think a lot of that, again, has to come back to where the money is getting funneled. And I think a lot more of that money needs to be, you know, placed into those land management uh, facilities, whether it be, you know, giving that land back to the natives to be able to manage and creating a transition plan for that or um, the facilities that are already in place to be able to do that. I understand also, you know, native lands are sacred. So geotagging that stuff might be a horrible, horrible idea. Um, so um, just trying to, it's, I think it's a case by case, as you were saying, like not trying to be a gatekeeper and the, you know, the sensitivity of certain locations. I think that's very mindful and being aware of that, but also, you know, being open to like having individuals reach out to you, be like, Hey, like, I'd love to know where you're going. Like, would you be open to sharing that? And, you know, I, I try to do it privately just because backcountry skiing is so dangerous in the first place that I don't want people to just like go out there randomly without any kind of avalanche knowledge or any kind of, you know, um, route finding knowledge and just get stuck and kind of have SO, like BSOL and kill them, pretty much die. So I don't, I don't really want to do that, but at least try to share the knowledge that helps provide um, a safe 
and um, accessible um, experience for the people that are watching, but also, you know, be mindful of which locations are open to be sharing in that sense as well. Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> no, it makes a lot of sense. Really well said. Connor, um, that, oh, Danny, go ahead. Danny, go ahead. Yeah. I think to, to kind of add to what Vasu said, there's this really cool thing. I think that, that hopefully at least some of the people in this, in this room have tapped into, which is taking a pulse on who your audience is on social media. Right. So you can do that by using polls. Um, you like do it. I forget the name of all these stickers, but the like top nine stickers when you open up your Instagram stories allow you to create polls and get people to weigh in. So you can ask people questions like, I mean, and I do this actually quite a bit because even though Instagram gives you basic demographic data of your followers, it's really important to understand. Like I say things like how many of you know this is versus that? How many of you have been here or there, right? Like, do you know what this word means? Yes or no? And it get, that type of approach really helps me develop like an idea of how I'm creating content that is tailored to the people that are following me. Um, and, and like, and for like, for example, for a while, I was a lot of people that were very much embedded in the, in the established, I call them the established mountain elite. <laughs> Um, people that already know how to do a lot of these things. And in the last two years, that's changed and shifted quite a bit. I have a, a lot bigger following of people that either have no interest whatsoever in going in the outdoors, but think it's just cool to look at pictures. And then I have some people that are new or want to learn more or somewhere in that kind of like introductory to intermediate level. Um, so it's really just cool, I think, to be able to create content and like have in your mind based on like, who's who's listening because we should be responding to people based on how they're listening and and speaking and engaging with us because otherwise like we're like we're just yelling into the void <laughs> great point last words connor or elsa um yeah i would just say what what both danny and Vasu has said is really valid because everything they said is really nuanced and that's how this conversation is. And I think it's a case by case basis. For me, most of the location tagging that I do um, is based on whose traditional homelands that I'm on and what value that that place has had to them. And for me, I do that for the reasons that Danny said, because I know that a majority of the audience that engages with my ski content are folks with a, with a bit more privilege. And my goal is to ed educate them. Um, and I think the, the flip side of that is then like, I get a lot of messages, um, when I post content and it's like, Oh, where's this cliff? And I'm like, that's probably not a question I'm going to answer. You know what I mean? Where's this cool art? Where's that's, that's really tricky. And it's, I don't have the energy and resources personally to vet whether someone has the skills and ability to know what days they should be sending a cliff in the back country and, like that's part of what we have to, you know, do in these spaces is form these relationships personally. And that is the reward of forming personal relationships is you kind of level up out there and you unlock the ability to, to push further, to get more physically fit, to go into spaces that you otherwise couldn't. And all those nuances are really important. And at the same time, like, I'm never going to be the one to hesitate to be like, yo, here's the, 25 degree low angle pow stash that I just found here because like there's, there's not a shortage of, of snow necessarily. I mean, from a climate change standpoint, there sort of is, but like that we are all accessing the same amount of snow. And I think like the powder fever pushing and clawing over each other idea is kind of detrimental. And I, that's something that I, I would definitely work to combat. But I think at the same time, like, you know, there's there's a really deep level of it um, with backcountry skiing that it, you you should find a mentor. You should take time to get to know places for your own safety. Um, and at the same time, because of that, there are folks that like I do specifically seek out and mentor. And I think that's maybe the most important thing that we could be doing on, on all of this is like find folks that you can mentor and um, you know, maybe for, for people like Danny and Vasu and I, they're members of the, the 
community that that we have an affinity with, whether that's you know BIPOC, uh, disabled, LGBTQ, whatever. You can find members of that affinity of, of your own to, to take out. And if you come from a more privileged background, you know, I would I would encourage you to seek out a diversity of people in, in who you mentor. And mentoring can look like touring with someone every week. Mentor can look like touring with someone once or twice a season. Mentoring could look like having a Zoom conversation. Like there's a lot of different ways that that can look. But I think like uh, mentoring is is the antithesis of, of gatekeeping. And I don't think geotagging necessarily itself is the, the direct enemy of, of access, if that makes sense. It does, makes great sense. Well said, Connor. Last word, Elsa, before we wrap up. I wanna be quick, um, but I think it's really telling actually that everybody's kind of ended up not talking about geotagging and we've been having a lot of conversations internally and I just think that we don't feel as though that is really the important issue anymore. I think that that information is out there online and, um, you know, to withhold it is just, it. I think that that just does kind of um, play into a gatekeeping attitude. I'm not from this country and I don't know <laughs> lots of places even really close to me. Um, and I don't think that, I think that the information's out there. And so somebody not geotagging something is not going to be the thing that stops anybody going somewhere. And so I think from our point of view, we're kind of trying to figure out, well, what it, what is the, what is the way to actually be useful on social media? Because I don't think that, yeah, um, lacking the location information is really uh, the most interesting thing that we could be doing. Yeah, that's well said. Yep, I think mentorship is what we land on. It's what we started on. Um, so in the interest of everyone's time, we're about seven minutes past the hour. We spilled over a little bit, but well done. I'm sure there are other questions that people have and we're, we're happy to connect you with our panelists. If you have further questions or want to develop relationships, um, that's part of what this conference is all about. Thank you all so much for attending this conference. Uh, it's been a great six sessions. Again, we look forward to doing it in person next round in 2023. Uh, very much look forward to that. And thank you so much to our panelists for uh, taking the time and sharing your experience and expertise. And um, Melinda will follow up with some links and resources and a survey and, and places where you can find the recordings. Please do share and spread the word and keep up the good work, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you.